Thank you, Brother James. We're always grateful to the Lord that we can come and praise his name through the hearing of his word. But we also must take consideration that there is many ways that God has spoken to us and that one of those ways is to praise him in song. And the Lord is a master craftsman. Indeed, the Psalm uh, 47 today was actually dealing with that particular issue. And that's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at Habakkuk 3.1, of which I've titled Glorifying God in Song. Let us begin with prayer. Blessed Lord of heaven, we just ask you, Lord, to meet us at this place, that indeed we would glorify you in all things, Lord. And in all ways, because you created us, Father, to be able to live for you. You have given us our lives, and though many say life is a gift, it really is a responsibility, Lord. You have called us to have a responsibility to be a righteous people, to reflect your character. And part of reflecting your character, Lord, is looking at what your own very son Jesus Christ did, which is that he honored you with obedience. So I pray that you would give us the ability to indeed be obedient, to do it not begrudgingly, but with full joy, for that is the first commandment, to love our God with all our heart, soul, and might. And so I ask you that today, Father, you would meet us at this place, that you would allow this word to be effective, that you would allow me to be an instrument to deliver your goodness, and that the people, your people, Lord, would be blessed. For we ask it in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to thank the pastor for giving me the uh, difficult uh, job of uh, creating a whole sermon out of uh, one verse. He's uh, been very good at it, but uh, today I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, actually uh, learn his, his craft at this. And as we look at the, uh, uh, actually, verse three, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse one of Habakkuk three, it says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigionot. Now, this is very puzzling to me, because when it says, you know, according to Shigionot, I was, I was thinking, okay, so is this someone writing on Habakkuk praying? It's kind of an odd thing to do, right? But as I began to actually do research into this, Turns out that shigenot is actually a musical term. So what this is actually saying is that it's a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to a musical term. So this is a very interesting thing because is Habakkuk a mythical figure? Yes. Right? No. We're talking about someone who's a real person, right? And yet we have what is a prayer and it's being done in the form of a song. Furthermore, is he in the Psalms? No. He is his, he's a prophet, right? So we know that's one of the ways that he is a historical figure. But yet we have a song, a prayer, and a song that is being given in Habakkuk 3.1. So what I'd like to consider is the fact that just because something is poetic, just because something is done in song, it doesn't mean that it's not real. In many of the seminaries and school today, they're actually teaching that a lot of the things in the Bible are actually things that are made up. And I want to use as an example the book of Job. Was Job a real person? Yes, right? But did you guys know how many of you actually knew that, that that particular book is actually written in poetic form? It's actually written as poetry. And so because of that, many have said that because of the fact that it's written in poetry, that it is not actually a true account. One of the reasons why it's difficult is because it does uh, mention a place that it is in the land of Uz, but in reality, Job is a Gentile, and so we don't know too much about the background of the book of Job, right? Whereas we know plenty, of course, about Israel, and we know plenty about the, the people of God. So that has led some people to say, no, you know what? This, this is a Jewish work about a Gentile. But what I want to actually show you guys is how dynamic the Lord is. The Lord is a very dynamic being because he speaks through us in many ways. And one of the things that, we're, that I want you to consider is first of all, the book of Job, where is it in? Is it in the prophets? No. Is it in the, in the books of Moses? Because it, it, it is a pretty early work. No, it's actually next to the Psalms, next to the Proverbs, right, right along with what's called the Ketuvim in Hebrew. And what that is, is that is a writing. So it is indeed a poetic work, the way the, the other books are. But the reason that we know that, in fact, this is an individual that is a historical figure is because he's actually referenced in other parts of Scripture. So let us consider Ezekiel 14, 14. It says, 
Even these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They would deliver, but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. I want to do a little correction on this uh, particular verse because it has a very strange wording. So I want to use a different translation to read to you guys so that it makes more sense. It actually says, even though these, this is from the uh, New American Standard Bible. Even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness, they could only save themselves, declares the Lord God. I think that makes more sense, right? So what happens is that, if you notice here, is Daniel a uh, fictitious figure? No, he's a historical figure. Was Noah a fictitious figure? No. As a matter of fact, we have plenty of evidence for Noah because around the world there are actually various accounts about the flood. It's not only in the Bible, so that's one of the ways that we know that it was true, right? But Job is mentioned right in there. Now that's the Old Testament. Now let us consider the book of James, chapter 5. And let us read that verse there. It says, Behold, we consider, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So he's used as an example, and it's actually a very important thing to understand that he was a real person. Because, you know, we have a lot of uh, fables, right? We have Aesop's fables, you know, that teaches the different morals, right? But at the end of the day, they're fictitious, right? These are fictitious stories that are teaching us things. If the story of Job was a fictitious thing, how many of us could actually really understand the patience of faith, the patience of God? Doesn't it make more impact knowing that it was a real person? That a, per that a person who was actually tested in his faith and suffered as long as uh, Job did and yet was steadfast. The fact that this is a real account speaks to us because if God gave him that faith and he gave him the strength to get through those things, which most of us do not go through, then the Lord can get you through whatever you are going through. So praise God for these men that he raised up and that the fact that these were real men and that as the scripture says, that these things that were written were written for our benefit. The, the things of old were written for our benefit, for those of us who are reading the word of God. Continuing on, I'd like to now look at the actual term of shigiano and what it means. So I want to read, uh, I want to go ahead and read this uh, quote that I have. It says, Shigianoth means to play in an excited way according to GodQuestions.org. Most commentators think the word Shigianoth carried the idea of strong emotion, erratic wandering, and wild tumult. Thus, the song was composed as a dithyram, a vehement, impassioned poem. So in other words, when you're reading the uh, chapter 3 of the book of Job, it's supposed to really carry a big drama. This is Habakkuk writing something that is very strongly emotional. So he's, he's giving a prayer to God that's strongly emotional, but the interesting thing is that He's also, in essence, it's not only a prayer, but it's a song. So it's a song that's supposed to be meant to be sung with strong emotion. Now, why do I emphasize that? The reason I emphasize that is because we are a Reformed church. Now, for those of you who have been to other Reformed churches, right, as many of us who, who came, came from them remember, you know, for instance, I went to Reformed Baptist Church that's in La Mirada. They're actually very moderate in their way that they do their worship. And a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the historical Reformed churches, there's very much a, a more passive attitude that is taken, you know, in terms of the worship of God, of which I will say that I actually respect. Because I grew up in a Baptist church. I'm a Hispanic. It was a Spanish church. So most of us tend to have, uh, and actually grown up in a Pentecostal churches, which we know is a little different, a little too wild in my opinion. <laughs> you know, but I think that, you know, one of the things that, that was very much stressed to me by my grandmother was that God is about a voice. And that you are supposed to have a high respect for God because God is king. And that thus, when we take our attitude towards God, that's the attitude that you should take. And I think that a lot of the Reformed churches take that attitude. But one of the things that I do want to mention is that when you look at the Psalms, what are the Psalms reflecting? Are the Psalms all solemn, you know, songs? No, they actually reflect a number of different attitudes. And we have not only one writer, but different writers who are reflecting these things. And so we're seeing how dynamic actually the worship of God should be. The worship of God isn't just to praise him and to call upon him when, when we are in need. It is also to express gratitude. It is to speak of the nature of God, of his creation. There's many, many things that the word of God does. And so it's very, so this is actually a great example of that that we have in, in, the, in the book of Habakkuk. I'd like to also consider us Psalm 7. 
Psalm 7 of David on Cush of the tribe of Benjamin uses the word Shagion, which is similar to the form Shigino, but it is a uh, it is actually a, a plural, I believe, and it's but it is a liturgical term that is being used. So that in the uh, in I believe in the in the Psalm of, in Psalm 7, it's actually done in the plural, speaking of the congregation doing this in an excited way. And this is a very interesting thing because this shows us how complex really God has made his people. Because those of you who are familiar with music and are, and are familiar with things like what's called music theory, and you know, it's not only about notes, but it's also about time signatures, you know, about, you know, uh, speaking of those things, you know, what's, what you have the treble clef, the bass clef, so it's talking about these different things. Well, we're seeing that even in the ancient times, even in the ancient times of the songs, which way predated classical music, they were using these kind of concepts. So God is, is, was really motivating and maturing his people very early on. We can even see that actually in, in some, of the, uh, some of the things that the ancient people, some of the ancient people did. And a lot of times we tend to think of ourselves kind of you know, being up here and the ancients being down here, being ignorant people. But there are things that we don't know how they were done. The pyramids, we, have, we really have no idea how, how they were done. And I mean, we got some very big blocks you know, that, that were used. Now, you know, one of the things that we do know is that they uh, had slaves to do that. But I'm sure there were some slaves who lost their lives in the process of that. I remember seeing, uh, there's a film, I was interested in, in, in learning about the life of uh, Che Guevara, and there's a film called The uh, Motorcycle Diaries. And there's a particular uh, section in the film where he actually gets to uh, Peru. And when he's in Peru, you know, there's, uh, there's two different walls. There's the walls that were made by the ancient people, you know, the, the natives, and then the people that were made by the Spanish. You know, so you have this little boy, indigenous boy, you know, kind of being very uh, braggadocious, saying, see, he, he, he says in Spanish, these are the walls of the Incas, right? And he says, you see that wall over there, the one with the small stone? He says, those are the incapaces, me meaning the incapable ones, right? And so they were trying to say, look, we, we were able to pick, build these big stones, and these guys built these little little stones. But what I always ask myself is, well, how many people died making putting those little stones compared to the people who put the big stones, right? I think there's a big difference in that if you consider that, you know? And so we see that God is, uh, as, as I said, uh, not only very dynamic in what he brings and, in, and what he's able to make man do. And so one of the things that we want to consider is that when we look at God, we look at God not in a two-dimensional way, but we have to look at God in a three-dimensional way. So it's not enough to just come to church on Sunday, you know, and read your Bible and have personal prayer, but that we have to God, honor God in all things. If you, are, if you run a business, using godly principles is a way of honoring God. If you do music, right, as, we, as we're learning, even if you're doing worldly music, you can do that to the honor of God. Everything should be done to the honor of God. Because the, if the Holy Spirit lives within us, is he only showing up on Sundays and when we're praying? Or when we're doing a Sunday school with the kids? No, he's always there. And this is what we're learning through the word of God, that in all things, we have to honor God. Now, I do want to point out verse at the very end of Habakkuk 3. There's uh, the final verse, which is uh, verse 19. And I put 19b because this is at the end where it says to the choir master with stringed instruments. So we see how this is not only something that's supposed to be a prayer. It's not, it's not merely a song that's supposed to be done in an excited fashion, but it's very specific. It's even saying that it's to be done to stringed instruments. And, and this goes back to what we were saying, which is that God is very dynamic. You know. Continuing further now, I want to do a comparison between Psalm 7 that I had spoken about and Habakkuk 3 so that you can kind of see this uh, similarity and comparison in how the theology works. And, in, and believe it or not, actually, uh, Psalm 47, which we looked at earlier, is very relevant to this. But let us consider uh, verses 6 through 9 in Psalm 7. It says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. So that's what we have in Psalm 7. Now let us consider Habakkuk 3, 5 through 9. It says, 
Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? And what is this? What is the similarity between the two? That you have basically a call to God to protect his people, to save his people, and to avenge his people. And so this is something that's actually very common that you see in the Psalms. And that this is one of the ways when we feel these things, if you ever feel wrong, brothers, call out to the Lord. Praise him to the Lord. Because one of the things that we learn from the Lord is that he, he repays each man according to his ways. Now, this is an interesting thing because I don't know if you guys have ever thought about this. Uh, I, I actually had a good discussion with, with Brother Alan on this because, you know, there's this idea out there of people saying, oh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I believe in karma, right? And karma is as, as you give, so it, so it will be with you, right? And it's kind of an interesting thing because if you look at karma, I mean, karma to me is really nothing. What does that mean? So you have this cycle of things that are happening. But what's controlling that cycle? There's nothing, right? All you're saying is, hey, what comes around goes around. But if you notice, the scripture actually does, in essence, speak of that. But it speaks of why this is happening. Because it is God who repays man according to his ways. And this is why it's so important that the lives that we live here on earth be a wise one. That we do follow righteousness because God will pay us according to our ways. We will suffer the consequences of what we do. Another way, as uh, Brother Allen had uh, mentioned uh, to me, was that another way to look at it is we reap what we sow. So we have to be very careful in the way we live, we live our lives. And that's why we have to be depending on the Spirit of God and most of all be actually glorifying in God. Because the thing that I like about this particular uh, book of Habakkuk is that it's showing us that there should be indeed an emotion to the things of God. It's very easy for us to get excited about things in the world, right? Or things that we enjoy. But do we necessarily take that particular attitude towards the things of God? Are we overjoyed in the Lord? In what the scripture mentions as exaltation, exulting. Because I will tell you one thing. We have plenty of texts that speak of the Lord exulting over us. So we should be exulting in the Lord. And one of the wonderful ways to do that is to do it through song. And I, want, and I want you to notice that it's also in prayer. So having strong, effectual prayer is very much also a part of the way that we glorify our God. Next up, I'd like to uh, actually take a look at uh, the, next, the last psalm that we did, which was Psalm 46, which we publicly read last week. And in Psalm 46, which we read last week, we find a similar command. And Encyclopedia.com states the following. It says, Alamoth, in the Bible, musical term, unknown in meaning, although some have guessed soprano, connected it with a word for maiden. It occurs in the first chronicles and in the title of Psalm 46. The term Shimoneth in the titles of Psalm 6 and 12 has been explained as base, complementary to Alamoth. And I use this as a further example as how we see this dynamicism that's within the word of God and how even in the Psalms they had these, these way of expressing these things. And so we have uh, Alamoth, which was actually a, a word which they believe is connected to female singing because it's used of females in First Chronicles and, and in the title of Psalm 6. But then we have the other, the other ones, which is in Psalm 6 and 12, which is a shimoneth, speaking of bass. So I don't know if that might have been perhaps a command to, for the men to sing. But we see that the, the glory of God, the glorifying of God, the worship of God, is it only for the men? No. It's also for the women. Women are very much involved in the worship of God. And that's one thing that we have to definitely consider, especially in these days, because, you know, these days it seems like they're trying to mix everything up, right? If you're a man, you can say you're a woman. If you're a woman, you can say you're a man. And if you don't want to be anything, guess what? You can be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but we know that when God made them, he made them what? Male. Male and female, right? So that's one of the things that we consider. Now, what I want to go ahead and do now is take consideration how the Psalms give us examples of how there's different things that we can look unto the Lord. Because I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me that most of the time when I hear Christian music, it tends to be kind of happy music, right? 
Sometimes he got some somber songs, but most of it tends to be happy music, praising the Lord, saying to the Lord how wonderful he is. But when you read the Psalms, is that all we have? No. We have Psalms in which the people are crying out to the Lord. And as I was actually having a conversation earlier uh, this morning with Brother Johnny, there are Psalms that are written where David is saying, Lord, where are you? Where are you, Lord? He's talking about how he feels abandoned by God. How many of you as a Christian have felt that? Have been in a dark hour and you felt, is the Lord there? In, Lord, am I? Sometimes not even about knowing whether the Lord is there. It's, am I in you? Am I saved? Am I really a Christian? And yet, do we have music today expressing that? We don't have music expressing that. We don't have people talking about the justice of God in song. We don't have, you know, music talking about the rearing of children and teaching the law of God to the world. And yet, when we read the Psalms, that's what we read. We read examples of these things. So let us begin with, with uh, Psalm 105. And I'd like to read actually from, uh, from a reference actually that I have uh, Brother James to thank. Because he recommended a book called The Psalms of Christ by theolo uh, or, or a scholar actually by the name of Daniel Fletcher. And it's a really good book. It's a book in which this is what he does is he looks at the Psalms and he, and he looks at particular Psalms that are not messianic. That are not very clearly messianic. And he speaks to how these Psalms are messianic in light of the fact that when we look at the New Testament, we're told that who was the Old Testament written about? It's all about Christ, right? It's all about Jesus. So that when we look at the Psalms, we got to also look at how even if it's not mentioning the word Messiah or son, it still has an application to Christ. And so he says of the Psalms, he says that it is a storehouse of human emotions that resonates with our emotional and spiritual experiences as we wrestle with the mystery of faith. Psalms is not pop psychology, but deep spirituality written from faith, for faith, whether in the heights of spiritual jubilation or the depths of personal agony. And so I love that because it really expresses how if we are human beings, right, if we experience confusion, if we experience all these different things, let us give it to the Lord. Let us speak to the Lord. We obviously speak to the Lord in prayer, but we see that one of the wonderful ways that we can also speak to the Lord is in song. That is one of the ways in which it is done. We're going back to uh, Psalm 105, we read, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. What I like about here is that this is basically declaring how when you do, when, when you do singing, one of the ways that we can also show is giving our testimony. We know that when when it comes to dealing with individuals, perhaps family members, neighbors, coworkers, what do we like to do? Or what do we try to do? We try to testify of God's greatness, right? We speak to the people about our testimony that we have of God. Well, one of the wonderful ways that that could be expressed is through song. And as we see in this particular psalm, uh, I'm not sure if it's a psalm of David. Uh, this is, you know, whoever the psalmist is, he's actually expressing this. Continuing forward, we have Psalm Psalm, uh, Psalm 49, Psalm 49, verse 4, which says, I will turn my ear to a proverb, and the harp will, I, I, and, excuse me, and with the harp I will expound my riddle. Now, this is interesting because, for instance, we all know about the book of Proverbs, right? And the book of Proverbs is basically wisdom. And in essence, it's really advice because the context of Solomon is that he is writing to his son, right? He's writing to a son and giving him wisdom by which he could live by. But I like the second, the second uh, part of the verse, which says, with the harp, I will expound my riddle. Because here, what it's showing us is that one of the ways that we express ourselves to God is through song. And so singing is, is a very important aspect of worshiping God. It's not mere vocal communication, but also also giving an essence, giving a sound, giving a song unto the Lord. Continuing forward, we have Psalm 101. I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord, I will sing praise. Now what I like here is that notice that it speaks about the justice of God. That singing of the justice of God. Why is this important? Well, the reason why that is important is because I think most of us have experienced injustice in this world, haven't we? 
And so one of the ways that makes God unique is that he is just. Now, there are those who question the justice of God. And uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with a uh, popular uh, professor of psychology by the name of Jordan Peterson, but he had a he had a interview with a renowned uh, British actor. You guys might not know him, but his, his name is Stephen Fry. And he's actually a very vocal atheist. And so he was having a dialogue with him and he actually actually dealt with this issue with him. He said, you know, you, you wrote this particular quote. I don't have the quote with me. It would have been nice to have had the quote. But it was a quote that was basically saying, when I look out into the world and I look at how people die of disaster, when I see the young children that are innocent, that are killed, you know, in, you know, innocent children that are killed, people that are, you know, ridden with disease, you know, who it wasn't their fault to have this disease. How, how can I believe in God when all this great evil happens upon people that don't deserve it? And so it was really interesting because I thought, wow, that's going to be an interesting uh, thing to hear Jordan Peterson because Jordan Peterson is not a Christian. He doesn't go to church and worship the Lord, but he does say that he believes in, in biblical principles. He does believe in the message of the Bible. He doesn't believe that it's a, he doesn't believe that the prophets were speaking of a, you know, figure in heaven that was doing it, but he believes that these are true, true statements within, within their moral values. And uh, what was interesting is that he actually made this point to the individual, which I thought was really good, which is he said, see, the problem is that when you argue these things, you're actually making that point even worse. You know, and I thought to myself, how so? The reason why is because you see, if you have a God, we know the character of God. God tells us what is good, right? So you can complain to God in a sense, the way we see in Habakkuk, right? Over the injustices that have happened. But if there's no God, brothers and sisters, what is there to complain about? Then what is good? What is evil? It's all meaningless. It's pointless. So I thought, wow, that's a very good, that was actually a very good answer. You know, and this is one of the reasons why we have to declare the justice of God. God is the lawgiver. And he has made everything perfectly, as we know. We've been studying in, uh, in the Sunday school, the uh, first chapter of Genesis. And what was it said after each end of the day? That it was good. Everything that God has done is good. What, is the, what does the Proverbs tell us? That God made man, what? Upright, right? But it is man who went his way, right? And evil has come because of man's thinking because of man's heart. The issue at the garden was not an issue of innocence. It was an issue of the heart. They knew God. Was not God good to them? Did he not make them good? And yet that very God told them, if you do, and, and by the way, it's very interesting because if you think about it, all he did was, he made it very, very easy on them. How many laws did he give them? He only gave them one law, one command of which they were not to do. Don't eat of that particular tree. And they couldn't even keep that one, right? And it wasn't just a woman. The man is just as guilty in it, right? <laughs> but we learned that, obviously, that as Adam being the head, because Adam fell, that's why we have the things that are happening. That's why we have the injustices that are happening. The thing that we have to understand is that we have a responsibility, not only as human beings, but as a people of God. And so we want to make sure that the life that we, that we are living is a life that is pleasing to the Lord. That's why for me, that's one of the things that's very important for me to pray. I always like to pray, Lord, allow us to be pleasing unto you as your son is pleasing to you. Because what did he say of Jesus, right? My son in whom I am well pleased. And he's always well pleased with his son. And we are being made in the image of who? In the image of Christ. So let us take an excitement into these things because one of the wonderful things that we know is that just as Job, right, who was faithful, though he himself had many questions, didn't he? If you look at the book of Job, it's actually an interesting, uh, interesting book because of that. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, but one of the reasons why they think that the book of Job wasn't even written at the time that they claim it was is because of the type of dialogue that there is between Job, not only with God, but with his friends. What they try to say is that because the first time you kind of have that kind of dialogue in history is when you have the Greeks. Because the Greeks, right, they got into philosophy and you have this dialogue. And so they say, oh, well, this is, just, this is just the Hebrews trying to be like the Greeks. You know, following the Greeks and they made up the stories. But if anything, actually, it might actually be proving otherwise, which is that God was already, in essence, giving us this before that. That this, this type of dialogue was already there. 
and one of the things obviously that we do learn that's wonderful in the book of Job is that God is, is, is manifested in his way because after all the dialogue and the Lord answers Job, what does he tell him? Who are you to question? Were you there when I created all these things? Do you understand the ways of the earth? The way of nature? Right? No. So who is he to, to answer to the Lord? But yet we know that the Lord is gracious because we have an example of this also in uh, Isaiah 64, which is actually what I, what I see as a reference to in Romans 9. We know that in Romans 9, we have the, uh, the famous saying of Paul saying that uh, the, Lord, the Lord is the potter and we are the clay, right? So who is, how, how is the clay to answer to the potter? Why did you make me this way, right? But in Isaiah 64, you have that declaration as well. It actually says that the Lord is the potter and the people are the clay. But in, what's interesting is that in, in, in Isaiah 54, it actually says, Lord, do not be angry with us. You know? So our attitude to the Lord should be one of reverence. But nevertheless, we see that the idea of communicating with God to express our discomfort is something that can be done because we see examples of that in Scripture. In essence, that's what we see in Judaism, they understand this. And one of the ways that they understand that is when you look at the, the account of Abraham and Sodom, Right? And that he was going to destroy the city. What did Abraham do? He said, Lord, could you destroy the city if there was 50 people? No. Is it 40? And so on, right? Now, contrary to those that are open theists, it wasn't Abraham teaching God. It was actually God <laughs> showing us that he was teaching Abraham. Right? And it's the same way, you know, it's the same way with our lives, brothers. If we have questions, it's okay to call upon the name of the Lord and to question. And perhaps even in song. Always remembering, though, that he is king and that he is uh, the creator. I want to look at uh, Psalm 150 because this is, I actually think, is, is uh, the best psalm of example because it really, in essence, gives a good essence of what it is to worship God. Psalm 150, verses 1 through 5. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for, surpass, for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Now, if you notice, uh, dancing was included in the brothers. So I don't know if we're going to start dancing here, but, <laughs> you know, but, it, but it does show us the expression that we got to have unto the Lord. It should be of such joy that we would even desire, you know, to... To, to dance. Now, one of the things that I did want to mention is that we, because we want to be a diligent people to follow what God commands us and to do things in an orderly fashion because God is not a God of confusion, you know, we do restrict ourselves to what the Bible says. And when we look at the New Testament, we, we try to be diligent to follow what the New Testament says. But a lot of times, because we're so caught up in the New Testament, and I think a lot of times it has to do because people have a harder time understanding the Old Testament. You know, we tend to just think of the elements that are in the New Testament. But I'll, but I'll give you an example of something. When the Lord says that all of these things are written about him, notice that he doesn't provide commentary on every single book of the Bible and give it. So this is something that, for instance, we are supposed to do. We are supposed to learn how to take this principle and look it back into Scripture. So in the same way, this is the way we got to look at worship. We have the Old Testament as an example of that. So when we have the Psalms and giving these different expressions, I think that the New Testament doesn't have to tell us, yeah, if you're feeling depressed, yeah, write a song to, to the Lord, you know, or if you're overly excited, you know, write a song to the Lord. I think these are things that we should learn naturally from the Psalms. It's in the same way that we look at the Old Testament law. There are those, and as a matter of fact, there are some who call themselves pastors and they're saying, oh, we don't need to deal with the Old Testament anymore. But what does the scripture say of itself? All scripture is profitable. Right? Is the Old Testament no longer scripture? Still scripture. Right? So everything we have to learn from everything. So that means that when it comes to that Old Testament law, and you have those strange uh, laws that, hey, don't eat shrimp, you know, don't eat camel, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, or don't wear, you know, two, two different fibers. It's not that God was being weird. It's that God was actually teaching a principle there. Primarily teaching what is the essence of his law, which is what? Holiness. And a lot of times when we think of holiness, we think of perfection, and that is an element of holiness. But another element of, of uh, holiness is separation. Separate. And that we as a people of God have to be a separate pe people from the way of the world. 
And I think that's actually an element that's very much a problem in our churches today. What I'm seeing today is that the churches want to be more like the world instead of being more like the word of God. They're compromising. They're interpreting the word of God by the world instead of interpreting the world by the word of God. And what, what, we, what we are being called to is to look at everything through the lens of God's eyes. So that's a very, very, very important thing. I want to end with two uh, applications that I see overarching uh, these particular issues. And the first one has to do with what Hebrews 1 says. So the book of Hebrews teaches us that God spoke to us in many ways, so we should glorify God in many ways. And that's what the text says. It says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Right? And what we see is, like, how did God speak to the prophets? He would use dreams. Right? At one time, he even used a donkey. Right? To, uh, or a mule. Right? To speak. And so... There's different ways in which God spoke, and I think that this is one of the principles that we see, that when we express our adoration and our glorifying of God, it should be, we should look to doing it in different ways. That's why we do the different things that, that's why our, our service is, is very different, right? We don't just come to church and hear uh, someone like myself just give a teaching, right? But what do we do? We pray together, right? We, we, we read the Psalms, right? You know, and, and we speak of the things, uh, the other things that are going on. We, we, we bring, we encourage fellowship within the, within the church. These are all different aspects that glorify God. So in that same way, we have to look at our lives. How can we, in our many ways that we're living, glorify the Lord? Second, I'd like to look at the second point, which is we are to encourage each other in song unto the Lord. Now, this is an interesting one because obviously I've been dealing with how we encourage we are we, sh we are encouraging god how we should glorify god but one of the ways that actually the scripture speaks to us to encourage one another is also in song and for that we have colossians 3 16 which says let the message of christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to god with gratitude in your hearts so this is one of the great ways that we can also do in singing and making music this is a wonderful wonderful gift i mean i'm i'm a big i'm a big fan if i could say it that way of, of music i love music i listen to music every day so to me i see this as a, as a rich rich gift of god but it's interesting that it's not only an expression that should be done unto the lord but it is something that we do also for ourselves and that's why it's good it's good for those of you who listen to christian music you know it's good it's good to do that but even if we have anything outside of that context, we can speak to each other and encourage one another in the things of the Lord that way. So I thank God for his, for his wonderful ways, for the fact that he's not a boring God, but that we know that everything that he does, he does it with great consideration to us. We have a, a life that's actually plentiful, and we should fill it with the plentifulness of God. So with that, brothers and sisters, I encourage you. I encourage you to... Consider glorifying God in song and consider how even in the other parts of scripture, we have examples of God being glorified in song, in poetry. In other words, being created, not merely having diction being given. So we glorify the Lord for that. And I'm, go I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end my preaching there. And uh, if I can go ahead and uh, have you guys uh, look to the Lord, we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and pray us out. Blessed Lord, we just ask you, Father, to fill our hearts with song. Give us a melody of joy. Give us a tone of somberness. Give us indeed a noise, Father, that is excited for you. Even in our times such as anger, Father, we should look to you. Because there is a righteous anger that is also given to the people of God. When we see the great evils of man, and let us not forget the evils of Satan and of Minion. But we have elements, we have beings, we have authorities, Lord, that are out there that are working against your kingdom, Lord. And that means us, working against us, because if we are part of your kingdom, Lord, then indeed we should pray and we should call upon your name. And not only look to our physical strength, Lord, when we speak of might, 
but also to your spiritual giving, Lord. And the fact that you have holy angels that are ministers that are given to your people, Father. I pray that you would always, Father, provide for us those that can fight against the wickedness that fights against us. Let us remember you in the evil day that we may glorify you and have thankfulness in all things. I pray that the people may go now into this world, Lord, with your word in mind, knowing that indeed, Father, we all have a responsibility to glorify you, to honor you, and to do it all with joy, even to the point of expressing it in song. For we ask it in your precious and holy name. Amen.